Action! Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to 2023. Right? I'm glad we left the year 2022 because you know what it was saying? Like 2020 was shit, and this year was saying, this is 2022. It's, it's 2020 as well. You know, nobody thought about that. Nobody thought about, you know, what is, what is 2022, you know? Um, this year is the beginning of the end and the beginning of the beginning. Beginning of the end of the old world and the beginning of the beginning of the new world. And the new world will continue until all of us die. And we'll probably, you know, if, we label, if we're lucky enough to live long enough, we'll see the vestiges of this old world come back at that point, right? So I hope this new year has brought some clarity, some understanding, or just something that you can use to grow through this process. The best we can do is just focus on growth. Welcome to our new studio. This is my porch now. Um, we have a question about uh, what's happening with Toco Crypto. Um, Toco Crypto was partially owned by Binance, and then Binance bought out the rest of Toco Crypto shares, fired the CEO, uh, and they're shutting down T Hub, they're shutting down all the extra expenses. That whole process is a normal process, right? When, when, when these times come, businesses fire people and then they shut down all extra expenses and they tighten down the, the, the batten down the hatches. That one's for Sandy. Um, and, you know, they get ready for the turmoil and bullshit, which is what we're doing, which is what everybody should be doing in this process, right? This is what we've been prepping for. I've been prepping for for 15 years. No, now 17 years. Um, 18 years. And... Just, that, that's, the, that's the process that's going on. What's happening with crypto, that's what we're gonna talk about, right? What's happening in crypto, within crypto space. But in order for us to get to that point, we have to, under, because crypto is not in a bubble by itself. It is within the world of finance, which is within the world of, you know, the world. So we really need to understand what is the, what is the history of these times in the world, right? We have that history, the cycles of history talk. Uh, sorry, there's feedback happening here. Um, there's cycles of history talk, which, uh, which um, defines very clearly how the cycles of history have gone. And then there's the talk of the changing world order with uh, at how the world order is changing and how crypto is a new world order with Ray Dalio. I'm gonna do, do those, those talks again because we need to refresh them and, and have a have a the updated view on how the things that we're seeing happen today are aligning with that whole process. So in the history of all this stuff happening, every time that we've seen civilization go through this collapse and rebirthing process, what ends up happening is there's an old world order. And the old world order has the reserve currency, has the power, has the military power, has the control of the global financial system effectively. And as, as that world order weakens, a new world order rises up and, and then it creates its own system. It creates its own reserve currency. It creates its own military power. And then those things clash. And then within 15-ish years, that transition happens. And without fail, it happens with war. War, you know, people dying. And that, that whole process is really dependent on demographics, right? A lot of people, miss the point of demographics. And demographics is the idea that in order for prosperity to happen in a financial sense, you need young people. You need young people to work. You need 30 to 40 year olds. You need 20 and 30 year olds to be working and creating prosperity, which is businesses that add value to people's lives, improving people's lives. You need 40 and 50 year olds investing, which is you know adding the money that they earned earlier into the economy, again, causing that growth. And you need 60 to 70 year olds and, and later on people to be, to be enjoying a, a lifestyle, right? But you need that cohort to be small. And this is purely on a financial sense, not on some kind of human or, or sense or anything like that. You know, it's basically, so when you have a, a small amount of retirees that are enjoying life, a decent amount of investors and the biggest amount of workforce, that's when the world rises into prosperity, right? That's what we saw after World War II, many people got killed. And then we saw the baby boom, you know, and we saw all these babies get born and we had generations of young people and the older people had been killed in the whole process. And 
and this sounds horrible, but this is the truth. This is literally the demographics truth that then the world rose up and then all the, everybody became workers and added value and built businesses and built houses and built everything around us. And as that, those populations aged, all the demographics people around like 1990s, they could already see, hey, Japan's demographics are getting too old. There, there aren't enough young people to work, so that means the economy is going to slow down. U.S. and Europe has, has gone to, towards that process now in the past 20 years. Russia has like no young people. It's like the young population in Russia is demolished. You know, China is, is now 10 years away from having this problem in a massive way. There are other countries like Indonesia where they have a really young population. India has a really young population. And they, that's where the growth is going to happen in these places. It's not some like, you know, voodoo magic. It's simply because there's young people who can work. And so the powers that be invest in those places because they know that there's, there's growth to be had. And these countries are not developed. So developing these countries and building stuff here is how you know, money has been generated in the past. So, the, so that transitionary process is happening because of demographics, right? And because these are the cycles of generations, right? And in the cycles of history talk, we, we discussed these are the cycles of generations that happen. There's, there's, demo, there's archetypes of generations that come along and they play a certain role in a certain space. And then from there on, they continue forth and they're, they're you know, the, the same cycles of history play out because of the cycles of generations and innovation cycles and all this kind of stuff. So financially speaking, in today's world, what we're seeing is, first of all, the banks across the world, when you look at their balance sheets, right? And a balance sheet is a balance sheet, right? It's like, if, if, it's like a household. When you think about yourself, if you have a ton of assets, like houses and investments and real things, and then you have some debt that's less than the value of the houses, plus less than what you're earning, then, that's, then you can run the household well. You can run your life well. As soon as you get to the point where your debts increase higher than what you own or, and what you make, then it's a problem. Then, you know, next step is bankruptcy, unless you fix those things. What we've seen now is banks, which are the financial holders of the entire world, their bank balance sheets have gone bananas. Like most of Europe, most of US, most of the Western world, the banks there have bank balance sheets, which is like, they're holding like 5% assets and 95% liabilities. So 5% actual and 95% debt. You know, and they've just been growing that over a long period of time. And the reason why bank bail-ins will happen, and we're going to show you a video of the FDIC, which is the insurance corporation from the U.S., admitting that they're going to bail Digress. The... The reason why bank bail-ins will happen is because these banks have insane amounts of debts that they have to pay back to somebody, and they don't. They only have five percent of the assets. So when the you know the the piper comes calling, they are going to have to take the money from the people in the bank accounts to give back to the people who they owe the debts to, right? But when you're looking at a country like Indonesia, Indonesian banks, because of the 1998 collapse, had have a different system where an Indonesian bank, if they have 100% assets, they're only allowed to lend out 70% of the value of those assets to people. So they can only have 70% maximum debt against 100% assets. If they have to pay back those debts, they can sell those assets and they can actually pay back those debts and still have 30% left, right? Indonesia went through this process a while back. So those bank balance sheets are one of the biggest concerns. And those bank balance sheets, a lot of them are invested into derivatives. Right? And derivatives are casino. It's a casino that making bets on the futures, future prices of things. Okay? That is the biggest concern when it comes to our money in the bank. Is that our, our money is held by people in debt. And they made a signed paperwork saying, when I have to pay back my debt, I'm going to take your money. And we went, yep, sounds good. I don't know what this paper says. But sign it because I need it to be able to live life. One of the ways that that, that transition is going to happen is central bank digital currencies. Right? So central bank digital currencies is simply the same money we have. They can print unlimited amounts of it. They have the same kind of control. The same people have the same control. But with this, they can program it, right? Because the plan is now that the West has become prosperous and made all the money and the, and the rest of the world wants to get rich, now they're going to say, no, 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 no. We're going to program the money because, you know, everybody's destroying the world, which is true. Everybody's destroying the world, wanting stuff. So we're going to program the money and we're going to control what you can buy. You have to be a good citizen. You have to do all these things. And you have to buy things that we want you to buy. Otherwise, 
the money, the money just will be programmed so it doesn't work. It's not crypto. It's not crypto at all. It might be based on blockchain, maybe, but it's not crypto, right? Crypto is an asset. This is money, currency, money, currency that we're talking about. The, 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 the point is when, they're gonna, when the banking system collapses, they're gonna bank bail in everybody in that process. And then what do, what do people do when that happens? People riot, right? When people riot, they're gonna go, wait, 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 we'll give you a new form of money. We'll give you this digital form of money. Just sign up on this place and hit I agree on our terms. Hit I agree on our terms. And then we'll put free money in your pocket because we can print unlimited amounts of it. We'll put free money into your pocket, but the free money we give you, you can't spend it on stuff, right? On the stuff that we don't want you to spend it on. And people are going to sign up for that because that process is how the world goes. And yes, Indobanks are more secure. According to my analysis, Indobanks are more secure, simply because the financial system is set up in a way where they're over collateralized, not under collateralized. Could we like jack up the, the, the lighting on this camera and just wash out the background? No, the, 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 the ISO or whatever on it. I don't know if you can change the mid, mid thing, but. Otherwise, it looks like a silhouette talking. I know, this is a very mysterious lighting. We're still figuring all this stuff out. So, the reason why this transition is happening is because that, this world that we speak about of investors investing into companies, companies going out and building stuff and hiring people to make work happen, it's been based on a system called the, state, the shareholder system, right? The shareholder capitalism. Shareholder capitalism is a simple idea that the point of a company is to make the most amount of money for its shareholders, period. It caused all the problems we have today, but that it's also the reason why the system worked the way that it did. It generated so much wealth because wealth was the point, and wealth is improving people's lives and lifestyles and all this kind of stuff. This is a guy named Mark Moss. He has, he's a legend of explaining all these transitionary processes and stuff. And in that, you're going to see literally the FDIC the Federal Depository Insurance Corporation, who are the people who are insuring the bank deposits in U.S. banks, having a meeting and admitting that they know people are going to be bailed in. There's literally no other option, but they don't want to tell people because they don't want to panic them. Okay? So, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll bring that up and we'll, we'll show you that. And, and that is how the world order switches. So let's play that, please. This is the Center for Stakeholder Capitalism. Well, on the World Economic Forum website, um, you can see I have the logo right here. You can find this handy matrix right here. And so we have what we call it considered capitalism or shareholder capitalism, they call it, is that the business is there to increase profits and for the shareholders, the owners. Yeah, surprise. The owners start a business to give themselves profit. But what they wanted to have is what's called stakeholder capitalism, where all stakeholders matter equally. Now, what's all stakeholders? Well, they say that um, the community and the environment and the world all has a stake in what this business does. And so now this business can't just be out for its owners or its shareholders. Now it has to be um, following the guidelines of all the stakeholders, which is basically everybody in the world. Well, how do you quantify that? How do you quantify what the um, demands are? Well, you need a, a measurable objective, and that's called ESG. And so they have to be environmental, socially, and they have to have proper governance. Now, what do those entail? Well, it entails whatever they say. So net zero, Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, woke capital, uh, no fossil fuels, whatever it happens to be, and those are quantifiable. And if you don't meet those criteria, then you become economic roadkill, as they say. So this is what's happening. This is the agenda. And it's scary. Like I said, the plan is already cracking apart. It already cracked through. There's lots of pushback where people are pushing back with their money. They're pulling their money away from evil corporations like BlackRock. And you should too. Don't give them your money. Learn to manage it on your own or give it to other asset managers. There's one that's recently popped up called Strive Asset Management that's trying to compete against BlackRock and has your better interests. Or manage your money on your own. There's options there. But it also highlights how we can push back and win on this if we vote with our money, or what I'm calling building out the parallel economy. I'll talk about that in a minute. All right, but BlackRock's 
forecast. What do they say is going to happen in 2023? We want to know because we want to front run it or invest along with them so we can get rich like Jay Powell, right? So they say that there's a new regime coming. Now, I say this all the time. The world we're going into is not the same as the world we're leaving behind. So what is this new regime? The four decade period, the last 40 years, of largely stable activity and inflation is now behind us. So whatever's happened the last 40 or 50 years, that was a once in a lifetime period, that's over. So we're not going back to that, all right? The new regime of greater economic and market volatility is now playing out. So what do we expect in the future, next year and beyond? Lots more volatility, lots of prices going up and down, a lot more shortages of products, uh, market volatility, all that. And it says here that central banks are deliberately causing recessions. This is BlackRock. BlackRock says this. Central banks are deliberately causing recessions, and of course, Jay Powell tells us this all the time, that his goal is to crush demand or make you feel broke. It says here, a key feature of this new regime, the one that we're going into, remember, whatever your financial advisor tells you, just invest for the long term, stay in the market, 60-40 bond split. That's all old, that was for the old regime. There's a new regime. You have to get on board with this. We are in a world shaped by production constraints. So the world is gonna have a lot more production constraints moving forward, a lot more supply chain um, restrictions, we're gonna have a lot more onshoring, nearshoring, all of this has to get rebuilt. That's why inflation is so high, and that's why I talk about all the time. I believe that this might be some of the lowest inflation we'll see for the rest of the decade. Now, nothing goes up or down in a straight line, so inflation goes up, comes down a little bit, up, 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 and down. All right, so that's the part of the new regime. Now, what else? They also said that you have to understand that there's a brutal trade-off coming. So central bank policy rates are not the tool to resolve production constraints. So the reason why prices went up on food and on oil was not because there was too much demand. There weren't too many buyers of it. It's that the production constraints, we had a drop in supply. Now the central banks, their policy rates are not the tool to fix that. If we, have a, if we have a shortage of supply, the, the goal would be to get more supply, but they can't get more supply, so they're trying to crush demand. But as Blacker said, that's not the tool. So they either, they're gonna have to either trade off one or the other. They're either gonna get inflation back to 2% targets by either crushing demand, so that means crushing your retirement account, crushing the value of your home by crushing demand, or they're gonna have to live with more inflation, and that's my bet. I believe the Fed is gonna just live with more inflation. They're gonna have to. That's the world that we're going into. All right, so we're gonna have more inflation. We know the world's gonna change. Part of the reason why three main factors are this, I've been talking about this in many videos, we see three long-term trends keeping production capacity constrained. One, aging populations. This is one of the greatest problems that we're facing moving forward, is that the populations in the developed world, China's the worst, most of Europe is really bad, um, the US is uh, looking a little bit better, but most of the developed world has aging populations that are going to time out. We don't have enough young people coming up, and so what we're really facing is population decline. That means continued worker shortages in many major economies, which leads to supply constraints. We're also, number two, persistent geopolitical tensions. What's happening with Russia and Ukraine, what's happening in China, Taiwan, what's happening with Israel, Iran, this is not, again, just something new that's gonna be resolved and we're gonna go back to normal. No, we're gonna continue to have geopolitical tensions. We're, we're breaking from a centralized world into a decentralized world, into a multipolar world. That's gonna continue, it's gonna rewire globalization and supply chains pushing inflation back up. Number three, the transition of net zero carbon emissions. They're gonna to continue to try to shut down our cheap and readily available um, fossil fuel supply and move us to inconsistent, unreliable, and very expensive green energies. So they're gonna to continue to do this transition, which is gonna cause energy supply and demand mismatches. Energy supply and demand mismatches. When there's supply demand mismatches, what happens? Oh yeah, prices go back up. When the price of energy goes up, everything goes up. If I'm a factory manufacturing widgets, but my energy prices go up, my widget price goes up as well. So what worked in the past isn't gonna work anymore. The world we're going into is not the one we're leaving behind. That's what I keep saying.
All right, so what do we do about this? <laughs> Mark, Mark, you're giving me the problem. The world's gonna change. All right, we're going to a new regime. What am I gonna do? How do I front run this? Well, there's a couple things. Uh, first of all, there's a new playbook. And so we need new tools. I believe there's a new world being built and there's, a, there's this giant opportunity in the parallel economy. So the way that we invest is gonna be different. Also, the business opportunities are gonna be different. I'm gonna hold a three-day event where I'm gonna have a bunch of speakers and panelists and experts and explain what this new parallel economy is, how you can take advantage of it, how you can invest in it, how you can convert your business or start a new business. I think it's the biggest opportunity that we have. And it's how we push back on this. So this is how BlackRock is starting to crumble right now because parallel structures are being built like Strive Asset Management. So I'm gonna, there's a link down below if you wanna check it out, three days. We're gonna go through all this. I'm gonna tell you all about this opportunity and how to invest in it. So if you really wanna know. However, what are we gonna do with our investments? Well, there's a new playbook and this is again from BlackRock. So the one thing that we have to know is that there's gonna be more frequent changes. This is per BlackRock. So the days of, again, Time in the market, just put it in there, wait for 50 years, buy your index funds, 60-40 bond split. That's, that's over, right? That, that, that's over, that's the old regime. The new regime is there's gonna be more frequent changes. There's gonna be massive volatility. And so we need to be able to in and out. We need to go long, we need to go short. We need to be able to ride the waves of volatility. We also have to have new investment strategies. So those new investment strategies are again, not just thrown in a 60-40 portfolio or a mutual fund and just sitting back for 40 years. Now we need to have more granular views. So right now, energy is doing really good or maybe commodities will do really good. Te tech is down, right? And so instead of being so broadly focused, we're gonna have to look very granular at things. Even with real estate, it's not gonna be real estate in the United States, it's gonna be, what about Tampa, Florida versus San Francisco, California? San Francisco is the worst real estate in the nation right now, Tampa, Florida is one of the best. And so we're gonna have to look at it much more granularly. We're gonna have to look at sectors, so energy, specifically uranium, for example, specifically in enrichment or whatever. Uh, and we have to look at regions, Tampa, Florida versus San Francisco. We also need to look at sub -asset, asset classes. So again, energy, but not just energy, how about uranium, right? And not just uranium, but how about this new company that's building these uranium reactors, for example. So sub asset classes, not broad exposure. Now they give us a couple playbooks that we can take a look at. So it says right here, we are here. So right now, they say that there is not enough damage in the price. So what's gonna happen, so remember, they said that the, the central banks are trying to crash the markets. They're saying that it is not priced in yet. So that means they believe there's going to be more drawdowns in the markets. So risk off damage is not priced in, is what they're saying right here. And so in the equities market, that's stocks, um, they're short. In the credit markets, they believe that they're a little bit positive on that. Um, now we can look at a little bit more granular view if you wanna look at stocks and equities. Now we can see, for the most part, they're short all of that. Um, in developed markets, they're short, they're underweight. The United States, they're short or underweight. In Europe, they're underweight. In the UK, they're underweight. In Japan, China, emerging markets, and Asia, they're neutral. So. They're, they're a little bit neutral. They're not really bullish or positive on any of the equities, neutral on a few countries, and uh, underweight on most of the developed countries. That was developing markets, United States, Europe, and the UK. So that's the plan. You need to be tactically managing your portfolio. I've been writing a financial newsletter for five years now called the Tactical Asset Report, so it kind of fits in with what we're doing. But that's it, that's the plan. There's a new regime. This video, uh, which is called Mark Moss's uh how BlackRock runs the world and what they say comes next, please watch it. Because in there is a part where literally the FDIC admits, the panel of the actual people who run the FDIC admit that they're gonna take everybody's money. But what he just said, right? You have to change the way you invest. We have to change the way we invest. And that's why we've been on this train for too long, right? We have to move out of those Western markets that are dying. We have to move into these newer markets that are developing. We have to move out of the old ways of doing things, the shareholder capitalism, and we have to move to the new stakeholder capitalism. You know why crypto is called staking? Stakeholder, right? Everybody has a stake. When you own, when you own a coin, you got a stake. You know, now now you're 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 incentivized to make sure the system runs properly. That's stakeholder capitalism. We we have to take control of our own finances, and and do it in a way where it makes sense not just to depend on anybody, not just to even depend on me. Like, here's a, here's a beautiful download I had the other day. It was like, you know, there are no experts in today. 
there are no experts today because the experts of today are the experts of yesterday. And today is tomorrow, right? Today is already the future. And nobody's an expert in tomorrow. The best we can do is make our best guesses of tomorrow. There are no experts today because they're the experts of yesterday. And today is tomorrow. Now, original quote. But when you think about the world like that, and when, you, when the people who run the world are telling you this, ESG is made by BlackRock. SDG is made by Sustainable Development Goals is made by the UN, right? The World Economic Forum is saying that they're gonna create, they, they are the new world order, right? The, the, the new world order is a one world order. And what's happened is in this previous cycle, all this money that was brought in and all this, this debt that was taken on, you can't pay with the amount of money we have. So it's just a fact that every single time in history, the only solution is to print a ton of money to pay back the numbers of debt that, that are there. And when they print money, it's legal counterfeiting. It's them literally stealing money from your pocket without touching your bank account. And at this point, and, and this time, they're gonna actually touch the bank account too. But they print money and they pay back those debts. And then the whole system resets and then a new system comes along and the new system doesn't have debt and it's actually assets, digital assets. And then slowly over the next 100 years, those, those digital assets get turned into debt and then they blow up the system again, okay? This isn't something new, but these, 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 these viewpoints are really important. So not only do the banks have debt, the countries have debt. Can you please pull up the debt to GDP ratio graphic? Because the other important part is when a country is wealthy, they don't generate insane amounts of debt. And when a country has insane amounts of debt, they are now broke, you know, in simple terms. So this is a chart of the debt to GDP ratio of countries by 2021. It's grown significantly from there until now, but just by until 2021. So let's scroll down a bit, please. More, more, more. Okay, so it's so right there, right there, right there. That's good. The middle, the middle part of it. Um, so you can see. Can, can you just cent center the center the the graphic, please, or zoom out a little bit? It's okay. That that's fine. So, Japan has two hundred fifty seven percent debt to GDP, which means the amount of money Japan makes in a year, they owe two hundred fifty seven percent of that, and now about two hundred eighty something percent of that money as debt, which means they can't pay it back. Even if they took the entire money that they make and put it into, into paying debt, they're not gonna be able to pay it back. US is at 130%. The, the golden rule is a country above 100% is already on the way to collapse. Above 130%, we're in the red zone. <laughs> Anything like Greece is at 207%. We know what happened in Greece. Sudan, we know how Sudan's going. Eritrea, Italy, all these countries we know what, what happens in those countries. They melt down and they have a complete financial collapse in those, in those countries. US is next on the docket. US has the, has the privilege of being able to print money to infinity, but even them printing money to infinity makes us all broke and poor, right? So what we want to do, so Indonesia's debt to GDP is 40% because Indonesia is wealthy, right? They had a meltdown back in 1998 where you know they, they printed a bunch of Indonesian rupiah to try to control the, the collapse. And at that point, the Indonesian rupiah became worthless, bunch of people became poor. But after that, they created a system where now their debt to GDP in numbers is 40%, which means what they make in a year, they only owe 40% of that. And they're, they're careful about taking debt from all of these, you know, World Bank, IMF, all of these organizations that normally would uh, enslave through debt. Now, the thing with countries is today, everything is done in the US dollar. Right, like he said, in simple terms, there's, there's two things that run the world, right? It's food and energy. That's, a, that's the easiest way of thinking about it. People need to eat and people need to use energy to, to build things and move around and do all those kind of things. Those things are priced in the US dollar. So that means every country who wants to participate in the financial system needs to get US dollar. They hold something called foreign currency reserves for them to be able to buy the things that they need, buy oil and buy all of these things. From the, the debt of a country and how many foreign currency reserves they own, you can easily see how much runway they have left before they melt down, right? And the reason why I wanted to call this, let me, let me back up. 
what what's happened is like when when the dollar was removed from being backed by gold, it effectively became backed by the oil, right? It became the petrodollar because if energy is life and and you need dollars to buy oil, that means you know the price of basically the dollar is backed by oil in simple terms, right? Oil powers everything. Our entire world runs on oil. No oil means everything stops, right? The reason why I wanted to call this talk the end game is we have now clear signals. And again, this talk from Mark Moss defines this in, in even more clarity. We are now as sure as we can be. And this is a warning that came from the global organizations that 69 countries are at default are at risk of default this year. That means 69 countries are at risk of going bankrupt this year. 107 countries within the next few years. That's half the world. They, they, they literally, their debt's too high. They're not making enough money. Economy is suffering. And they, you know, this is what happens when you shut down the entire world, especially poor countries. So can you pull up the, please, the, the fragile state index? So, the, you know, when you're looking at the fragility of society, we can look at the fragility of a country. And from there, you can see the future. And with the, all these statistics, uh, statistics happening, right? Can you just zoom into that chart, please? And then just move it over to the left a little bit. So that's, uh... oh, that's okay. That's okay. That's fine. Um, there we have it. There's the view of the stability of a country, right? It, how likely it is to melt down. Indonesia is in warning state because it is a developing country. Of course, the West, all of Europe looks green. You know, Canada, very green. Australia, very green. The US looking good. But, you know, it, it, basically we have the world ready to melt down. And in order for the, this process to happen, all these countries are going to melt down. And we're watching this happen bit by bit by bit by bit by bit, you know, Syria and da 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 da, da all these countries that, that we've seen go into chaos. That's the, that, that's the precursor to the rest of the world reaching that point because it's all based on money and debt and finances. And this is how the bankers run and control the world. So what happens in a country when it melts out? One of the biggest things is oil becomes unaffordable, right? Fuel shortages. And eventually, fuel shipments stop. Imports stop because the country is poor, so they're not able to import things that they need for the people to live, which a lot of countries import food and import oil, right? Food, food prices spike because now food is so expensive because it's hard to get into the country, which leads to famines and all these kind of things. Energy prices spike, obviously. Food production starts to have issues, right? And now what we've seen is the most countries import fertilizer and other things necessary for them to actually create food production in the country. And Ukraine was producing an insane amount of food for the world, one of the biggest food producers in the world, done. Fertilizer shipments stopped a while back. When there's no food and there's no energy, people go out into the streets and riot. And they, they overturn governments and they overturn the system and they, and they fight to feed their kids. You know what's a great solution for that? Lockdowns. Let's just lock them down. Okay. That seems logical. All of that process ends with war. This is just how countries melt down and the world melts down and all this kind of stuff. So now, at, what's the war that's on the horizon? It's China and US. They're fighting for Taiwan. And people don't under, fully understand the importance of Taiwan. Every single important chip that's made in the world, every single important chip, and chips are the, the new oil of the world, they are made in Taiwan at one factory called TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, okay, TSMC. China has to take it because now the U.S. has shut down the shipment of machines that, were, that could print those chips to China because there's only one company that makes it in Europe and they stop those shipments to China. Which means in order for China to continue in this future, they have to take Taiwan. And China's already preparing and they're getting ready to go and, and all this stuff. The US is gonna use that as an excuse to go to war with China. US and China go to war and this entire system's done. 
the old world system is completely done. It, it'll, it, it won't happen tomorrow. It's going to take some time to play out. But, you know, when we were talking about, before we started the recording, we we're talking about after craziness, World War II, the world becomes more stable and peaceful because, you know, we just had a war. Then there's prosperity and consistency and slow growth for a long period of time, usually 40 to 60 years. And then chaos and change starts, which is the last 30 years. And then it gets, it accelerates at a pace that starts to confuse people, which is today. And then it just, it goes asymptotic. Chaos goes asymptotic, food prices go asymptotic. Asymptotic just means it goes like this. It doesn't, it doesn't ever reach you know, infinity, but it just it starts to accelerate at a pace that is unimaginable to the people who've existed in a world of stability. This war and all of these things, they are now on the horizon already. It's guaranteed. It's like, unless history is, has finally started to change and humans have changed their behavior, which they haven't, um, the same thing's gonna play out. Within the next few years, that, that war is gonna happen and it, within China and, and uh, the US, it's gonna happen over Taiwan and TSMC. And then in that process, China melts down, right? Because as soon as China goes to war with, with the rest of the countries, the rest of the countries don't buy stuff from China. China's already, you know, they're, they're, they're barely holding on and they melt down. When China melts down, a quarter of the world melts down or whatever, whatever number that they are. Let's look at Russia. What happened in Russia? Russia was working, producing oil, shipping it through a pipeline to everybody. The US decided, they, they attacked Ukraine. I'm not going to take sides on that. It's, it is politics. They attack Ukraine. U.S. shuts off SWIFT, instantly basically shuts off all their money. Their money, they tried to make the money worthless, but they basically shut, shut down their money. Today, Russians can't invest in most projects, even our projects. We have to be very careful about Russians coming into projects, depending on which jurisdiction allows Russians to invest. So they just block their money right, like that. They blew up, the U.S. most likely, blew up the pipeline that was shipping the oil to Europe. So now their, their oil's not moving. The banks in Russia started to block people, especially overseas banks. They just, they were like, look, we can't move the money, your money's gone, okay? What happened in Sri Lanka? Sri Lanka, beautiful people, beautiful country, great food production, amazing for tourism, and they borrowed too much. They borrowed $56 billion from the IMF and World Bank. And that's 70% of their GDP. They borrowed that in like, I think it was 10 years or something. Please watch the Mark Moss talk. He defines it in detail. Uh, no, actually, I think that's from, yeah, it's, it is that talk. Then they cut taxes. Then COVID hit. And now the government doesn't have money and they have too much debt and they don't have the money to pay it back. The tourism stopped because of COVID. Now one of their biggest, now they have less taxes. They have less money coming in from tourism. And then the final death knell was the, the global globalists convinced them to switch to organic farming like that. Like all farmers need to switch to organic farming, no fertilizer. Now food production stops. Their foreign reserves dried up to $1.8 billion, which means it's not enough money for them to buy oil and other things. Oil stops, food stops, imports stop, complete meltdown, currency went ridiculous, and currently Sri Lanka is in riots. Standard. El Salvador. El Salvador, they announced we're going to allow Bitcoin to be legal tender. And I, I remember saying this, I was like, oh shit, they're fucked. They are so fucked that, oh yeah, this is going to be demonetized now because I said fucked, right? But who cares? We're not, we're not even monetizing this in the first place. Um, they, they literally, what was I talking about? El Salvador. El Salvador. El Salvador. El Salvador said that they're going to make Bitcoin legal tender. And then the world bankers were like, oh, really? You're gonna do that? Watch what happens to your country. They have $21 billion in debt today. They have $3.4 billion in foreign reserves left, which means they have $3.4 billion of money left to buy all the stuff necessary, especially oil for them, because they can't buy oil in any other currency. The IMF is making them pay. And now China is buying an island from them to take control of some of their land, to give them some money. And their country is going down into complete meltdown. Riots, food shortages, 
rinse, repeat. Argentina. Argentina has $274 billion in debt, has $42 billion of reserve left to buy things. Their inflation is at 70% a year. We're, we're, we're over here, you know, concerned about 8%, 9%, which is the fake inflation, is realistically like 15%. Their inflation is at 70% a year, which means every year they lose 70% of their purchasing power. We're losing 15, 20%, depending on how you calculate it. They're losing 70% a year on their money, and they can't buy stuff. And the, the economy shutting down, the riots, all that stuff. Turkey, $451 billion of debt. $7.4 billion in reserves. Turkey is being cooked like a turkey. I know. You got to joke a little bit about life. Lebanon, $39 billion of debt. $11 billion of reserves left. Nobody in the, all the banks took all the money. People can't convert to dollars. They can't buy stuff. Country went into complete meltdown mode. War state. Egypt. $157 billion of debt and $33 billion of reserves. Egypt is on the brink of a collapse as we speak. China, full on protests in China and the Chinese do not protest, you know, because they have social credit scores. And if you protest, you will end up either dead or in a jail or you can, literally cannot buy anything to live life. And the Chinese are protesting in the streets as we speak today because that's how bad it's gotten there. They literally locked people in and welded the doors on the buildings for the last year, over a year. The real estate market completely melted down. Banks have blocked people. Banks are not giving people their money in China. The Saudis, who are, who are providing the oil to make the petrodollar be the petrodollar, have basically shown the middle finger to the U.S. And them and Russia have teamed up. And them, Russia, and China are aligning to now fight against the US. Now, in this whole process, it's not China that's gonna be the future US. It's the people making all of this happen. They're called bankers. They're the ones who run the world, they're the ones who have the money, they're the ones who own the system, they're the ones who are making the new system. So the, there you go. That is the end game. This is the end game now playing out within the next year, within the next three years, we're going to see the meltdown of the entire world, of the financial system, of all this stuff. Okay. As always, these are problems, right? Actually, I'm going to go into the solutions at the end, like I always do. But looking forward, what is it that we can project is likely to happen? Which, what, what the powers that be, what they always need is an excuse. Right? COVID was the excuse. We didn't want to shut down the world. COVID made us shut down the world. What we're going to see coming up is black swan events. You know, events that are unpredictable, that we don't know what it's going to be. It's going to be big events. It, like cyber attacks are something definitely on the, on the docket. They're, all, they're almost guaranteed to happen because this war isn't the kind of war that we've had before. That, that was a fourth generation war. I think, wow, that's fourth generation. That means there were three more, three generations before that. World War II was the fourth generation war. We're in the fifth generation war. And the fifth generation war is played in the mind, in the physical body, in digital space, in economics, in movements of people, in regulations, and then guns and bombs and blah, 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 blah. So these black swan events are going to be the reason to do that. But one black swan event, China wants to take Taiwan. Black swan event, nobody could have predicted that. Cyber attacks, black swan event, nobody could have predicted that. Um, to, 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 to just take all the money from your bank. The entire financial system, system melting down. Black swan event, nobody could have predicted that. And these things are guaranteed. They're guaranteed. Whenever black swan events happen, the next thing they do is they print money. Because it's like, hey, we got to go to war, print the money. By a financial system meltdown, print money. COVID, print money. The solution to all the problems is printing money. Because remember, we got to pay these debts back. So we got to have excuses to print all this money. If we just print it while the people are, while there's nothing going on, people will get mad, right? So they print the money and they pump it into the economy. And like the Ray Dalio talk says, every time in history, when a, this is, these, these situations come, when they print money, 
that money, people take that money and they go buy assets with it. They go buy real wealth with it because the money is becoming worthless over time. So digital assets, real estate, okay? It's, and, and the assets don't just go like this. Remember? It's like the gold chart that we looked at. They go like this. It's consistency for years and years and years and decades and decades. Then they do this. Then the volatility gets higher. They go up and then drop and then up and then drop and then up and then drop. And in that chaos, most people sell the bottom. Welcome to crypto. Most people sell the bottom. But then they pump again because we sell the bottom, collapse the system. Okay, now we need to print a bunch of money to save you. That money rushes into the assets. Everything spikes again, right? So assets spike and then drop. Spike and then drop. Along the way, when the, the, the war is kind of the final death now, and the war is complete chaos, in that process, the old system collapses, and usually it takes five years for that process to play out and calm down, but it takes about 15 years for the global reserve currencies to switch and all this stuff. And now we're seeing the, the faith in the US dollar being lost. You know, the Saudis don't trust the US anymore, that's why they, they, they misaligned with them. That is the Great Reset. That's how the Great Reset plays out. But now here's the positive side of all that. This is the transition to the new system, right? We're in the end of the begin. We're in the beginning of the end, but we're also at the beginning of the beginning. And the beginning of the beginning is the beginning of a new way of doing things. It's no longer just about making the most amount of money. It's about quality of life. It's about independence. It's about taking control of your food sources, control of your energy sources, con producing locally. Globally, if supply chains are shutting down, producing stuff locally and building communities that allow you to be able to do that. The programmable money, the bad side is, it's programmable money. The good side is, money will start to move like data moves today, right? Instant. It will become part of the framework of society. Value will start to move fluidly, which actually creates more prosperity on the other side for those who know how to use it. Carbon credits. Money's going to be tied to carbon credits. That's just that they've already told us many times, but basically it's going to become, oh, you're a poor country, you want to eat steaks. Well, guess what? Your steak creates a lot of carbon. So unless you have a bunch of this money, which we're printing and controlling and programming, which you, so you won't have it. Eat that steak. Sorry, the world's fucked up. You're the problem, okay? And then complete digital control of the entire economy and the way people of people's behavior, right? And that's all being manifested through AI. A, a vast majority is being manifested through AI. AI systems are going to be taking over jobs and taking over all this stuff. Now, the bad side of that is that it's, I mean, I don't have to tell you the bad side of it. It takes all your jobs and does its stuff for you and knows everything that you're doing and controls your behavior. That's not a peachy time. That's what China is going through right now. On the good side of that, we have the option to then have this omnipotent all-knowing entity that we can use, that we can actually start to deploy in systems and things that create the new world. So we can automate away a lot of the bullshit jobs that people are doing just to earn this fake thing called money, and they're not living life. They're not living actual life, right? If we can automate most of the bullshit that people do, you know what happens to a good soul when you take away the need for them to have money? they go do some amazing shit with their life. And that's what you're seeing. You're seeing people disconnect from the money way of thinking and connect more with, hey, if I just take the seed and put it into the ground, magic, food comes out. And you know what's great? It produces more seeds. And then those seeds literally just drop on the ground and more food comes out. So there's an infinite amount of food in the dirt. Okay, food's good. Water. Water is the new gold. Water's a problem. If you're somewhere where there's no water, it's not much that can be done about that. So having, okay, now you got food, maybe you got water. You got your water figured out. Energy. Well, we, we now have ways of pulling energy out of the sky, out of the wind, out of turbines in, in, the, in the water. This is what we're doing, right? We're going to get to that. Okay, so if I get energy, food, and water figured out, thank you for reminding me one of the most important things. And you have oxygen. Oxygen's good. It's free. It's here all the time. Then what is it that I really need? I need shelter. I need shelter. I need a roof over my head. Okay, well, in this process, if assets are doing this, we'll get 
within the next 10 years, we'll get so many opportunities. If we just don't panic and fuck this up, we'll have get so many opportunities to get a nice place. You know, and in Bali, like, I just built a place for pennies for what it takes in the US on a farm, okay? And, and we're gonna be presenting all that stuff to people who, who want to be able to do that. Then I can automate a lot of my life using AI. It'll do a lot of work for me that I actually need to do work. And if I just figure out then a way to use those systems to make me money while I don't have to spend time on it, now you leave me free to go and build the, build the world I want. And the way we build the world that we want is hugs. You gotta hug a lot of people. It's tiring sometimes, right? But it leaves us open for more hugs, more connection, more time with people, and more living the real life that exists and not the life of money and not focusing on money and making it life, okay? On one side, there's technocracy. There is the global control of the world systems and it looks horrible and from our perspective, it is. On the other side is historical proof that every single time these systems come out, they are better for the world. There's pain, but remember, trauma on the other side creates strength. So if we just are resilient enough to get through that process, beauty will come out because we will create it ourselves, right? So now, what am I doing? Like I'm, I'm gonna, I've, uh, one of the realizations I've had in, in, my, in my reflections that I've had in the end of last year, is I'm going to stop saying what you should do, what we should do. I don't know, okay? We're in the fog of war. We're completely in the fog of war. In the fog of war, I can't tell you what you should do, okay? I can just tell you the bullets are coming from there, and that's what they're firing, right? But here's what I'm doing. I realized, all I have, like me, right, me, if I just feel good, that is like the number one thing I need in my life, right? So I, I'm improving my physical health. I got fat in the last two years. And I was like, fuck that. Do I want to be fat in World War III? No. Okay, so I started focusing on my physical health. I, 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 I improve, yeah, I'm gonna stop saying you should do it, but I'm improving my physical health because health is wealth. Health is wealth. A billionaire will trade you all of their money just to have health. Time is wealth. Figuring out ways to get my time back so I can spend it with the people I love, especially in these trying testing times, to be able to spend more time with the people I love and less time chasing, the, chasing money to get to the point to be able to spend time with those people. Time is wealth. So figuring out way to optimize, ways to optimize time so that you know, I don't have to spend all my time just working, working. Mental resiliency. You could call it mental health, but I, I, I'm specifically talking about mental resiliency. That if you're somebody who has a nervous system that is anxious, I'm not like that, but you know, I, I work with a lot of people who have an anxious nervous system. We calm that nervous system, right? I have a system where like, I, I might, it, it, it likes to run a lot. It likes to just be on all the time. So I'm learning how to calm it down. Because when stuff comes, you don't want to just be rushing into it. You want to be calm and relaxed and, and focused and creating a state, a mental state that allows us to consistently get through this process. Spiritual health. For me, spiritual health is huge. I realized this from a, from a reflection and, and whole process that I went through. It showed me like, if I'm aligned with spirit and I'm aligned with my higher self or God or universe or whatever you want to call it, that gives me the faith to know everything is going to be okay. And if it's not, that's exactly what was supposed to happen. It's, it's good for me. Thank you so much. You know, if, if I die on this journey, fantastic. Thank you so much. I guess that's, that's, that's how the cookie crumbles. That's where the show ends. But you know what? It's been a good ride. It's been a really good ride. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Love you. Mwah. Okay. Physical health, mental health, resiliency, spiritual health. Financially speaking, when we're talking about the meltdown of the banks, the solution is, move your money out of giant banks that have massive debts, like Chase and all these banks, Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, HSBC, move it from there. First of all, if you just wanna keep the money in your own country, move it into smaller banks and credit unions. They tend to be much less leveraged and make stupid bets. Move it into brokerage accounts, like Schwab. Brokerage accounts are not allowed to make 
these stupid bets, and they're not beholden to bank bail-in laws. Move it to different jurisdictions if you have that privilege. Move it to different countries, right? Indonesia, we, we just looked at Indonesia's banking system is over collateralized. They have 100% debt or 100% assets and can only issue 70% debt. I like Indonesia. If this is the country that's going to be growing, this country is neutral between China and the US, this, the, the, the demographic is young, property values here are going insane, ballistic. And then the banking system itself has gone through the, the turbulence before and has been secured against a lot of the stuff. Yes, I like to move the money here. Now, that's just in the banking world itself. But also, moving for me, moving money into the digital assets is the biggest thing. Because it's like, if that's the new system, I want to connect to that system, but, but you know, like we've harped on about a long time, the way we're doing it is focusing on digital assets that are connected to real wealth. Because if food is wealth, let's figure out a digital asset that creates food. Done. If shipping that food is wealth, then let's figure out a digital asset that, that does that and connect it to a real business. Done. Called FarmSent. You know, farm productivity is five harvest oil. Commodity supply chains, food supply chains, FarmSent. Mines. Okay. I'm still thinking about a way to be able to get it into financial products because there are financial products that add value to people. But even more than that, just the cash itself, turning it into stable coins like USDC or what was the other one? BUSD, apparently. BUSD and USDP are actually really, they're actually even safer than uh, USDC, one of, the, one of our members pointed out. USDP. Yeah, the BUSD. Yeah, BUSD is, is Paxos, is backed by Paxos. So, and, and the thing is, the way the Paxos has set it up, even if Paxos goes bankrupt legally, it's held in a different account. So it will always be issued back to the people who hold it, which is not the case with USDC. So I was wrong about that. Thank you for thank you, Pierre, for for pointing that out. I'm gonna I'm gonna change that uh, that knowledge. And this is also an important point, right? He challenged. He was like, "Wait, but it's like this. It's set up so that it's even safer than USDC." And I was like, "You're 100 percent right. Thank you for giving me the knowledge." There's no experts, right? That's, that's just the money side of things, right? When, you, when we're thinking about wealth, we said health is wealth, time is wealth, independence is wealth, right? So for me, I'm now focused on the farm because if the end game is here, time to figure out all these things, you know? And I don't, as you know, I haven't just been talking about this, I've been doing it. Now we have 14 hectares of food for us that could feed thousands of people just from the food that's rotting on the trees, let alone the gardens we're planting with 20 something different heirloom veggies of all the delicious things us bule love to eat uh, in Indonesia, with two rivers running through it, with seven springs where delicious natural water comes out of the rocks after being purified by the soul of Bali with energy that you can't imagine. With mulberries every single place you walk with chickens, ducks, goats, turkeys, puppies. We don't eat the puppies. Um, we don't even eat the goats and stuff. It's, they're too cute. Fish. Well, I'm probably missing a bunch of things. And wait a minute. I just want, I just want you to hear this so you can really understand what, how, how crazy this is. This has like been a dream of mine for a long period of time. Mulberries, bananas, avocados, oranges, guavas, durian, mangosteen, mangoes, jackfruit, ginger, turmeric, chili, rice, red rice, cassava, clove, coconuts, honey, medicinal honey, papaya, pumpkins, taro, cacao, palm sugar, mushrooms, Balinese lemongrass, snake grass, cinnamon, tulsi, coffee, passion fruit, already growing. And this is not even an exhaustive list. I, I, we would just we would have hours and hours just to talk about all the medicine that's growing on the land. A waterfall, glamping, treehouse, 150 beehives, mud bath, sauna, two pizza ovens, woodworking shop, mechanic shop, and 70 cars and jeeps from the 80s, and trucks, and glass blowing shops. And a guy who has all of the knowledge to live off of the land from the ancient principles of how Bali lives. Okay, and I just, I, I'm just finishing building my house there. Okay, at that point, and then I'm gonna set up a, a, a water turbine, a wind turbine, solar, 
okay, to have too much energy, which we're just, at this point, we're just gonna hook it up to just set up lights everywhere, just to make everything beautiful. And like, we literally planted lights that are like plants, solar, solar lights with plants that have lights inside. So at nighttime, it looks like magical avatar land, okay? Because, you know, that's what I want. And pools and oh, everything, everything. So at that point, you can take all my money. Go ahead. You can take all the crypto. You can give me a terrible credit, social credit score. I don't even have money, to be honest. I'm broke. Like, you know, my social credit score is, doesn't mean anything for the money, right? And you guys know how to make sure you protect yourself against that. Shut down the internet, shut down the power, shut down fuel, shut down food, do it. I won't even notice. The only thing I'll notice is I'll just be like, oh, I guess the data is not working on my phone. And then you call telecom cell and they're like, hey, the world melted down. Please stay on hold while we reboot the world, right? Done. And now go there and meditate and do push-ups, and meet people, and hang out, and sit around a fire, and have a conversation about what life really is. You know, and, and at the same time, like, you know, I'm, I, I just spent 10 days there having these reflections, and I realized the beauty of actual life, and how privileged we all are to be part of this process. And this isn't just for me. I've laid the groundwork because I know there's a lot of beautiful souls that are listening, and that are gonna listen to this, and that have already reached out, who are, searching for this exact same thing, but just don't know how to find it. For me, I, I, you know, I, I'm blessed. It was just handed to me. It was every, all of these things were just brought to me and said, hey, I think you're the guy who's supposed to bring this to people. So if you're somebody who's thinking about that and interested in that, reach out. Because that, for me, after that point, you can do whatever you want. Now, looking at the world, at, at all the stuff that we talked about, how do we actually prosper in that process? Yes, digital assets are great. Yes, having these different businesses are great. For me, the moment AI came out, I started learning about it. I started becoming an expert. I realized I need to learn Python coding and I hate coding. I hate coding and I'm not gonna code, but I'm learning the coding anyway. I'm learning about AI. And then, are, and then the universe was like, hey, you're learning about AI here, how about this? Like, you know, why don't you build an AI that actually is a mentor that guides people to a deeper understanding of a sense of self. Yes, please. Yeah, so you're telling me you're gonna activate superheroes using AI by helping them find their, their true soul's purpose? Done. Let's go do stuff like that. And then in the meantime, just enjoying this thing. Enjoying this thing because, you know, a friend said this a while back and it really resonated. She said, Sim, now, no matter what happens, I will know that I just did my best that I just did my best, you know? Like I tried, I listened, I moved, I changed, I did, I did everything I possibly could in my power to be prepared and go through the process. Now whatever comes, Jesus take the wheel, Allah take the wheel, Buddha take the wheel, you know, whoever you want to put in the driver's seat, let it happen, right? And then, and then started focusing on love and community and people around us, right? Because when we actually look at the beauty that exists in our lives. If you're watching this, you have internet and you're, you have the time to spend two hours on a rant about the end game. We're privileged, we're privileged, okay? Appreciate that part. And if, if you're listening to this and you're like, this is the same old shit, Sim. You just told me a bunch of things that I've said before. And it's like, yeah, great. You're somebody who gets it. And as a matter of fact, Congratulations, that's it, you know, figure it out. So again, if you, wanna, if, if you want to participate in these things, reach out. We're actually now building a documentary. Building a documentary? We're producing a documentary, I guess. You don't build documentaries. We're building the farm and then we're producing a documentary about it that's gonna explain all of these things in thorough details and what kind of alignment there has to be for somebody to participate in that process. But if you're listening to this and you've been thinking about this and you're stressed out about any of these things, reach out, we'll put you on a list, we'll share that documentary, and soon we're gonna start food production there that will actually ship down to anybody in Bali. That'll be food, healing food beyond anything, you know, organic, shmorganic could ever, ever touch. Um, or people can build there, be part of it or people want, basically, I'm, just, I'm building a place and then we're gonna put it on Airbnb, so it's gonna be a business. 
it's the first Airbnb I'm building. I built a place, I'll be there for, I don't know, three days a week or something if I'm lucky, or sometimes go there for a little longer. The rest of the time, it's, it's a natural healing, uh, it's a jungle healing retreat, right? Plus glamping and all this beautiful stuff that you can do. Put it on Airbnb, within a year, it's gonna make me my money back, and then it's gonna make me money the whole time until all of this stuff happens, and then I get to go live there and be part of this whole process, right? So that's the beginning of my beginning. I'm not looking at this as the end, the, what is it, the beginning of the end, right? This is the beginning of the end for people who are holding on to that old system. This is the beginning of the beginning of the people who've let go and burnt all of the shit from the old world and are in open arms ready for the universe to create change in their lives. Now, I just want to close off on, we're, we're, gonna be, we're changing the way we're even doing this because so many people asked me, they said, Sim, you should put this on YouTube. This, this stuff needs to go out to people. You need to reach out to people because th there's not very many people that are talking about it. So we're changing the entire platform and we're calling it life is more than crypto. We're changing our message to life is more than crypto because that's what we've spoken about. And that's where my heart is centered and aligned and that's what came to me that we are now going to take this to the world. Obviously, there will be some talks which we have to... Is for private eyes only, because you know YouTube would instantly shut me down for shit like that. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna get this out to people. We're also gonna be cutting it into smaller pieces, so you don't have to sit here and listen to me ranting for this long. And you're like, I only wanted to, I only wanted like six pieces out of that. We're gonna cut it into smaller pieces. The talks are gonna go down to smaller pieces, and then I'm also just gonna be recording like you know as I've been doing one minute little tidbits that that just play on repeat until it makes sense. Uh, they're called shorts, right? So just Feel free to do that, but that's not just a that's not just a a branding thing. Life is more than crypto. Life is more than money. Life is more than all this fake bullshit that we're worried about. And just remember to look within and figure out what is really valuable in life. What is really valuable in life? Like, where is your heart aligned? Who are the people that is the heart aligned with? What is the, your mission and purpose that your heart is aligned with? And are you doing that? Or are you ignoring that for money? Or are you ignoring that sitting there watching crypto videos and going into panic because it doesn't make sense while you're wasting precious moments, the most precious resource, which you could spend doing other things that are more valuable and actually adding value to your life? Are you ignoring your physical health? Are you ignoring your mental health? Are you ignoring your spiritual health? Whichever one of those things are, are important to you, I think it's really important to, to go through the process. So like I, I actually went through a process called Elevation Barn and, and I'm building the AI for Elevation Barn and with Elevation Barn. And that process was really enlightening in showing me where my heart is and what matters and what is the bullshit that I'm just chasing for no reason. And I'm going to also do a talk where we take you guys through the process where we're gonna actually do a basic version of it, like they are the legends of doing it, but we're gonna do a basic version of it that helps you understand how to, how to systematize the ability to look within and figure out what your North Star is and find things that align to that and then break it down into actionable things that you can do to action those things. So life is more than crypto, so from now on we're gonna be talking about more than crypto, okay? Because I'll be honest, I've said everything I've, I could possibly say in all of this stuff. By now, if if you're new, um, it it's welcome. This is just how it's been for years. If you're old and you've been here, I mean, not old, wise. If you're wise and you've been here for a long time, um, thank you for listening. I will keep repeating some of these things, but at this point, telling people about it, the time to tell people about it is done. The time to do stuff about it is here. So. Come along with the journey and learn about life is more than crypto. Yes, this is the Zen garden. This is actually my, my terrace, I guess. You know, that's, that's what you call it. Um, since, you know, Toko Crypto is so broke now that they, they, they don't have a recording studio. We're now going to be sitting on the terrace, hopefully with better lighting. Um, and just shooting the shit and talking about stuff and relaxing and talking about how life is more than crypto. So welcome. Welcome to the new studio. Right? Now... Do we have any questions? Um, any questions from uh, from Zoom?
And I just want to say, like, you know, sometimes what I don't like is sometimes some people put me on a pedestal and they assume that I'm going to be right about everything. And I've been wrong about so many things. And like, nobody's going to be right. Are you kidding me? Like, especially not me. I'm just a human like everybody else. So you might be thinking, wow, look at this view. Oh my God, Sim is so happy. He must be crushing it. No, I'm just as broke as the rest of you. Right now, today, I'm as broke as the rest of you. I have investments. Every, all, every penny that comes in, I invest. And I'm sitting here in the same boat as everyone else. But this, this, in leading by example, this is it. If I feel good in my internal state, the rest of the stuff is all bullshit. Right? One yeah. So you withdrawn in the banks are more secure. Yeah. So we answered that. Like the we 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 Indonesian banks are definitely more secure. It's not even just about the banks, right? It's about the resiliency of the currency. So when you look at what happened to the euro compared to the dollar, and the yen compared to the Japanese yen compared to the dollar, and the pound compared to the dollar, oh my God, they got demolished. They got demolished. They had like. They lost between 25% and 30-something percent of their value just this last year, like that, okay? Because those countries are collapsing. Their economies are becoming worthless. We just saw that through the Black Blackhawk uh, video there, right? Indonesia's currency moved like 1 15th. Now it's about 2 15ths. No, 2 14ths. It moved about 2 14ths. Whatever that percentage is. What's the percentage, Cyril? Can you do the math? Two fourteenths. Two two fourteenths. Yeah. Okay. Two, Challenge your brain to do that one. So, the resiliency of that currency. It's about 10, 10, 10 to twelve percent, which is like fantastic in this world of complete shifts and changes and stuff. That means the country is wealthy. The country is stable. Their financial system is stable. Fifteen-ish percent. Our our math whiz is saying. Um, that means the country's stable. That means the currency is stable compared to the US, right? The country is rich. Like, Indonesia doesn't need oil. They have oil. Indonesia doesn't need natural resources. We have natural resources. Indonesia doesn't need food. We have too much food. It's rotting on the trees. Like, you can just drop a seed by mistake and it'll turn into food. Indonesia does not need water. Yes, Bali's having a water crisis, but it also rains down from the, from the sky constantly. And this is where the growth is going to be for the next 40 years. We have young population, which is like the name of economic growth. And all that comes together to be like, if I want to keep my money somewhere in a bank, yeah, this is, this is the place to keep it. Now, even here, keep it in different banks. You know, like OCBC is a good one. Uh, Mandiri is a good one. Uh, what's the other one? BNI is a government bank. That one's a good one. But again... Bank bail-ins are probably going to happen everywhere, right? So there's no guarantee that the banks here won't take your money either. Because, you know, we signed the same paperwork here. And banks here are much more ruthless than banks in the rest of the world. So besides crypto to keep in wallets, what about cash? Can I keep cash on exchanges or everything has to be in wallets? Do, don't keep cash on exchanges. Like, how is it better? It's actually worse than keeping it in a bank at this point. Right, because it's like you just took your money from a, from somewhere where at least there's some semblance of insurance, which is fake, and at some point they're gonna take all the money when we, when the shit goes completely bananas, and you moved it to a completely new private company that's just holding on to your money that has no insurance, that could go bankrupt. Private companies go bankrupt more often than I mean, look at the environment we're in. If FTX and all of these things haven't been uh, a signal of that. Yeah, keep it in your wallet. Like what I don't see a, I don't see a benefit to leaving the cash on an exchange other than, you know, feeling fearful around that, feeling nervous around it. So that's why one of the talks we're going to do and we're going to do not even just talks, it's going to be a workshop of explaining walking you, walking you through step by step of how to securely move your money into your own wallets. And, and store it in places where it's under your own custody. Because at this point, the only person you should trust is you. And if, you don't, if you're not moving it off exchanges, you don't trust you. 
Now that's the biggest problem we can have. You don't trust you. You don't have faith in your own ability to learn these things. And you know, it's easy, that's totally normal. Everybody goes through that process. But just think about this, who got you to where you are today? Look around, point to the person who got you to where you are today. You can't, you gotta go look in a mirror and point at the mirror, right? So, okay, so if you trust you to take care of you this well, that you got you to this point, then trust you. You know, you are gonna get you through the process. And you know what? If, if along the way you lose all of your money, guess what? That's what was supposed to happen. That's what the universe had in place. Then, then be thankful because who here hasn't seen rock bottom? You know, the, the, the people who actually get to the point of having the kind of internal states, especially the people who are watching this now, you know, we've seen rock bottom. We know what the, we know what the floor looks like. So you know, you know what I did on, uh, on New Year's? Or like not on New Year's, but like around New Year's? There's a, there's a celebration here called Galungan, which is the Balinese celebration, right? And Budi, our lovely friend, brother, and sage from, from the land we're talking about, um, he was like, hey, let's go sleep at a temple. And me being a bule, I was like, oh yeah, sleep at a temple. That sounds great. Like, you know, Airbnb at a temple or something. He's like, yeah, let's go sleep at a temple. I think you'll like it. Because, you know, you, you, I want you to experience this. So I go there in like a, in like a hoodie, thinking I'm smart because it's, it's, it's going to be some higher up into the mountain. And then I have a sarong, which is like a, you know, a sheet that you tie around your, your waist. And we get there. And it's getting, starting to be dark and it's raining and it is a, it's just a roof with pillars with a concrete floor. And he takes his entire family there twice a year for Galongan and they all sleep on the concrete floor. And I'm laying there and, I, and I'm cold so I then took the sheet off from around my waist, the, the, the sarong, and I just draped it over myself, right? And I'm lying there on the cold concrete floor and I'm so happy. I was so happy. Because I was like, hello, old friend, rock bottom. <laughs> hello, old lovely friend, rock bottom. I remember you. It's nice to see you again. It's nice to know you again. And, and, and it's easy to look at that and go, yeah, that's rock bottom. It's literally a concrete bottom floor. Yeah, but in Bali, at a temple, with spiritual energy through the freaking roof, where we lit a fire and laughed and had cooked noodles on an open fire and slept together as a family. Okay, that's not really rock bottom, is it? That's rock top. That's success of the highest order. It is a reminder of where we are today and the privilege that we lived in. And then, and when I came back and I had a warm bed to lay in, oh, I appreciate it. So no matter what happens, gratitude and appreciation for that happening is the most important. And just remember, you know, we all did our best. We all did our best. Beyond that, there's nothing else we can do except appreciate whatever happens in this whole journey and going all, all the way along the way. So yeah, that's it. It's, uh, it's one o'clock. Uh, we're going to actually sit here and record some content and just, you know, put out little tidbits that'll be a lot more, a lot easier to absorb for a lot of different people. Um, if you guys don't have any more questions, it's been lovely as always. I know I joked about this last time, but if you got to this point, actually do subscribe on YouTube and actually like it and actually share it. I know I'm eating my words. I do. I, it's humbling to do that often. <laughs> But please, yeah, go on YouTube, like it, subscribe, share it. Uh, we're now going to be reaching out to the world with all this stuff. It's not, it doesn't matter if you do or not. As long as you're listening, that's all I care about. And, and I just want you to know, if you're somebody who's watching this and listening, you are the people that I cherish the most. Because it's been a beautiful journey to get to this point and, and have all these beautiful souls around all of us that are actually taking control of their life that are actually doing something about it, that are actually aligning with their heart and actually aligning with the new system, we're gonna be just fine, my loves. Whatever life throws at us, it's you know water off a duck's back. So thank you for your time. Love you guys. See you next time. I have a dream that one of 
that one, the one that you are actually doing since 24 of my vision is to build youth talent centers would be awesome if these centers are in the ranch with animals and gardens for kids to grow own food, interact with animals and developing their talents at the same time. So I need everything, everything to work. That's what we have. It's already built. I guess what we're missing is kids. We need some kids to go there. So just, just bring your kids. I mean, like, no, we have kids. We have, we have kids come there all the time. It's actually a place where it's, uh, yeah, please go back and watch this whole thing. I'm going to do a whole another talk explain, and, and a documentary explaining that place. But it, this land is, has now become a retreat for people to come and live in the way that is the ancient way of doing things. Right, so yeah, my, my, like I've always said, my goal is to teach kids about their divinity. Not even teach them, just remind them of their divinity and, and keep it alive through the, the adulting process. And we are building it all together. So you got some kids, bring them down. We'll show them the farm. They'll have the best time ever running around goats and puppies and chickens and ducks and baby goats, right? But it's nice, it's beautiful to see that that's something that, that you're aligned with as well. Now, now if, that's, if that's how you're thinking about the world, it's gonna work. It's gonna work. Because spirit and energy and heart aligns for those people who have the, 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 what I call the work of God in their hearts, you know? So, yeah, we're gonna do it. But love, 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 love. See you guys next time.